happy banking crisis day. Happy Silicon Valley day. I don't know. What do we call it? Woo! Friday afternoon live stream, the best time of the week when I get to spend my time talking to you fine people about all things happening in the world of finance. And well, we got plenty to talk about today, don't we? Because today saw the largest banking collapse since the global financial crisis. Wow, it looks like that perma bear that I've been wearing on my sleeve all this time, maybe that was a little accurate. Or maybe that broken clock is just right at this time of day. You guys tell me. Um, but a lot of the doomers and the gloomers on the fin tubes have been vindicated today because we've been talking about this for a while. We've been saying that the Federal Reserve's actions, that the years of easy money policy and this bloated debt bubble, that it was all going to come to a head and that very soon we were going to be left with a choice. We could go down path A of a 1929-style bank failure, banking collapse, uh, deflationary death spiral, and that is where we are currently headed right now. Uh, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. We're in the, we've taken like one step down that road, but we can still yank the wheel, right? And, you know, cut across that little division in the middle, maybe run over a cone and make it to the other ramp. That takes us down the route of hyperinflation, which a lot of people are starting to say that's coming, that jerking of the wheel. And that will be Jerome Powell turning on the money printer. And, you know, I've been saying for a couple of weeks now, Look, folks, this Fed pivot talk, it's misplaced. We're talking about the wrong things. I was saying the Fed is not going to pivot, that the Fed has been telling us over and over again that they're not going to pivot, that they're going higher, they're going to stay there for longer. But if the Fed does pivot, it means something really, really bad has happened. Well, today, the second largest bank failure in U.S. history, the second largest savings and loan bank failure in U.S. history happened. The largest was Washington Mutual during the GFC. today. Silicon Valley Bank, with $209 billion in deposits, second largest savings and loan banking failure in history. And it is an official bank failure. The FDIC has taken them into receivership. Um, and if you want to know what happens now, you can check out that video I did last week about bank bail-ins and what that means now and how there's not going to be a taxpayer bailout. That's not going to happen this time around. It's in the law. But now the question is, what's next? Or maybe the question is, who's next? Or maybe we just say, now what? Because think about this in the terms of the FTX collapse, right? Remember, November 6th is when FTX really collapsed. It's when they halted deposit or halted withdrawals and everything. And then for the ensuing months, and we're still learning more and more every day, we found out who had exposure to FTX, who had loaned them money, who had their tokens or their assets in custody, right? And who was the next one that was going to fall? And then somebody else went bankrupt because of FTX. And then we found out that this sleaze ball sent this sleazy email or did this crooked thing, right? We are looking at weeks, months, maybe even years of that just off of what happened at Silicon Valley today. And that is all assuming that this doesn't continue. And we're going to look at a couple of other names today. There's a lot of banks that are now teetering on the edge and Silicon Valley may drag them over the edge with them, whether deserved or not. So we're going to bring in my man, Mish, here, and we are going to take a look at what's going on in markets. Mish, how are we doing today? Man, we were talking about this right before stream. It has been crazy today. Um, we were, you know, the last couple, three days with the, all the banking that's going on, we're like, okay, who's going to fail? And then it was like, boom, boom. And I feel like yeah, I mean, it. It happened so fast. I mean, we, we were talking about it all week, right? The, it started with Silvergate, and Silvergate didn't actually fail, right? Silvergate never went into FDIC receivership. Silvergate just announced they're closing their doors, that they can't do business anymore. Silvergate may end up in FDIC receivership, and I'd say that's probably a, a probability more so than a possibility at this point. But that hasn't happened yet. But it looks like what started with Silvergate took down Silicon Valley, and Silicon Valley much bigger than Silvergate. And, uh, well, we've got other names out there. We've got Signature Bank. A lot of people are wondering about banks all over the world are down. Yesterday, you know, we did that spontaneous live stream yesterday, and I was sitting here in disbelief. I'm watching all U.S. banks, all these GCIT banks were all down 5% yesterday, and nobody was saying a word about it in the press. I couldn't believe it. And, man, I tell you, if there's 
one thing you take away from this, folks, it is you cannot trust the mainstream financial press. They will not tell you until it's already too late because if they put the message out, it gives all the little guys a chance to get out before they do and their buddies do. And that's why you didn't hear anything about this until it had already happened yesterday. I was looking, Mish and I were talking, we're saying, well, JP Morgan's down 5%. Bank of America's down 6%. Wells Fargo, 5.5%. Something is up. Nothing but President Biden's silly budget was in the airwaves yesterday. There was not a word about banking collapse in the mainstream press until it had already happened. And then they finally went to, they finally went to press with it late, late yesterday after we had already done our live stream. So who can you trust for information? I'm not saying trust some random guy on YouTube. You have no reason to trust me, but hey, you can take what I say and then you can go do your own DD and you can prove or disprove whatever I'm saying. And by the way, if you can disprove what I'm saying, I would love to hear it. I won't even argue with you. I'd be fascinated by whatever information you have. I, this is great. It's you know, a two-way flow of information. Uh, the last three years has been the growth of the citizen reporter, if you will. Um, so that is an open First Amendment and there's so many of you now. It's great. The news is out there, and it's just crushing mainstream media. Yep. And, you know, the mainstream media, they have a financial incentive to not tell the whole story at this point because they get their money from the big players that right now don't want them to tell the whole story because there's a panic going on. And, you know, it's like... the. You're in an airplane and the pilot comes over the, the loudspeaker and says, uh, good news, folks. There's no reason to put on your life jacket right now. That, that's going to panic your passengers, isn't it? Right. That's not something you want to hear. So they're kind of hush hush and they're playing defense in financial press right now. But on FinTwit, on FinTube, you're going to get the doom and the gloom. Right. We do that here. I'll, 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 I'll cop to that right away. But you're going to get the unvarnished truth. And, you know, there's no there's no ropes pulling me one direction or the other to get me to say certain things other than if I say certain words, I'll get shadow banned. But, you know, they, they've already done that to me. What are they going to do? Shadow ban me again? Go ahead. Uh, I go on to say thank you very much to Mr. Kevin DeBella. DeBeja? Thank you, Kevin, who says, is this the start of the collapse that will get us all compliant with CBDCs? Will MBS blow up the whole debt bubble? Well, so Kevin, I, I, I want to do the good. second one first. The second question, I think it's okay. more CMBS this time over MBS. And yeah. I think CMBS, well, CMBS will blow up. They both played a role in uh, Sil Silicon Valley. If you looked at their 10K and what took down Silicon Valley, it was the losses in their mortgage-backed securities and their commercial mortgage-backed securities that took down that bank. It was not crypto that took down Silicon Valley. It was MBS and CMBS. And that's why every bank in the world was down yesterday, because every bank in the world is sitting on top of a mountain of unrealized losses in mortgage-backed securities and commercial mortgage-backed securities. And I got to send a shout out to Kirian Von Hest, aka Deso on Twitter. He's been on this channel before. Sharp guy, smart as a whip, and he's so just magnificently, wonderfully cynical. He's just a riot to talk to and to listen to. If you guys have not seen Kirian Von Hest, Deso, you got to be following him. Um, he puts most of his stuff on Twitch, but he's also on Twitter. And he has been banging on the table about mortgage-backed securities for years now, saying how they are so underwater that these ETFs that trade in supposedly AAA-rated mortgage-backed securities, they're trading at lower valuations than they traded at at the height of the GFC. And all these banks were just humming along like everything's okay. So, Kirian, good work, man. And uh, thank you, Kevin. You're Yeah, I do think this will be, MBS will be what blows it up. Does it take the whole market? That depends, right? We're in the early stages of a panic right now. Does it spread and does it continue? I don't know. Are they able to snuff it out? Maybe, but it's more of a psycho it's more of a psychology game right now than a numbers game. All right. Eventually the numbers always win, but for the moment, this is about psychology. Can they convince people to stop withdrawing their deposits from these vulnerable banks before it's too late? That's the question. And the part about the CBDCs, they will if they can. Will the crisis get bad enough? And if it gets bad enough, you bet your bottom dollar that they will try to jam CBDCs down our throat. Absolutely, freaking lutely Kevin. Good question, sir. Thank you for the support of the channel. And you guys are just rolling with them today. We are going to have a hard time keeping up with all you guys. Free like summer. Thank you, my good man. He says, if there's no contagion, 
why bank stocks are red worldwide. Hmm, that is a mystery, is it not, Mr. Free Like Summer? If there's no risk of contagion, if we're all so financially strong, then what is it that investors see? Why are they all selling their stocks at a loss right now? Maybe the simple answer is there is contagion free like summer. That is entirely plausible. And, uh, you know, again, watch some of the big names. We're going to look at some of the big names today. Signature Bank comes to mind, and there's some smaller regional banks that are just getting crushed right now. I don't know about the specifics of those banks. I just, I was looking for some, some information on them today, and I couldn't find anything specific to these banks about what was dragging it down. But we're going to warn you guys about some of the names to keep an eye out for that are probably going to be making headlines. So thank you, Free Like Summer. Thank, thank you all you guys for this, the Super Chats and support of the channel. You guys are awesome today. Thank you so much. EC660, yes, sir, we are live right now. And he says, came out from under my rock this morning, not unlike Patrick the Starfish, looked around and he said, F it and crawled back under my rock. Have a great weekend, everyone. Yeah, you know, for most people, it's a come on out from under the rock, go right back under it kind of day. I'll be honest with you guys. Like, I, I'm, I'm trying to contain my enthusiasm right now because look people are getting ruined financially and this is when i got to reel myself in and you know I, you can probably sense it you can see it i mean i'm vis visibly excited by this because you know I, i'm a i'm a austrian economist i'm a perma bearer financial youtuber right so you know i live for days like this but at the same time you know there's a lot of people that are looking around saying oh man like i'm ruined so you have to keep that in mind so um not to suck the energy out of the room. Man, didn't I just do that? But uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a good weekend to spend under the rock. Let's put it that way. And I hurt my back this weekend, so I won't be out doing any raking or any shoveling or any uh, big chicken projects this weekend. So I could probably stand to spend a little bit of time under that rock myself. Thank you very much, EC660, sir, for the super chat and the support of the channel. And Nashville Pasta Man, I do love that name. He's in the super chats. Also says, let me buy you a couple of Sonic Combos. I love Sonic. Oh, I'm trying to lose weight, Number Nashville one, Pasta Man. It's hot. <laughs> Mish is a fan of the of the Sonic combos as well. I like those little tater tots at Sonic. They are good, man. I just you can't let me near Sonic. Well, What's they're, the they're ratio of allocated? <laughs> What's the ratio of allocated to unallocated gold? Asking for a friend. You know, I don't think anybody really knows those numbers. What's the actual ratio of allocated to unallocated? And I think the gold industry, there may be some people in the gold industry who have that information, or maybe several people, if you combine their knowledge, they have that information. But if they did, that would be one of the most closely guarded secrets. And by closely guarded, I mean authorization of lethal force has been issued to protect that secret because that information alone, if anybody had that number, then we would be talking about a run on gold right now, a gold bank run. Because I suspect the number is startlingly high, and I know a lot of people on FinTwit and FinTube agree with me, that basically every bar of gold in the world has already been bought and is owned by 5 to 10, maybe even 100 different people. You're absolutely right, Nashville Pasta Man. And, uh, you know, what we're seeing today, we're going to look at the bond market in a little bit. We're going to see how this flight to safety has already started. When you get financial contagion, when counterparty risk becomes apparent to everybody, like it's starting to today, you get a stampede down Exeter's pyramid. People run for safety. You're seeing that in the bond market as interest rates decline today. People are buying bonds for safety. They're also buying gold. And if you wait until that is underway, you're going to find that there is no gold to buy. And if there is gold to buy, the premiums are just blowout high because all the physical gold has been bought and sold a hundred different times. So it's a good question. Your head is in the right place, Nashville Pasta Man, but I suspect that information is really hard to come by. And by really hard to come by, it means like if you have it, your life is probably in jeopardy. So don't go seeking that information. It's probably not the kind of questions you want to be caught asking around powerful people. And my man above my pay grade, what's going on, Amp Grade? My friend over there, he is saying dominoes are falling. One domino... We'll say two dominoes have fallen, right? We had uh, Signature was the first. I, I think I just flipped everybody the bird accidentally. Sorry. We had Signature was the first. And then, no, not Signature, Silvergate. Silvergate. Yeah, Mish, we, we talked about this. <laughs> silly Bank. We're going to call them all Silly Bank because they all sound the same. You've got Silvergate is kaput. They didn't fail, but they're going under. 
You've got Silicon Valley. They failed in FDIC receivership. And then you've got Signature Bank, who is, their stock is getting crushed, but they're so far, they're still in business and they're assuring us that they're financially strong. All combined, all of these SI, I'm, we're just going to call them all one name. We're just going to call them Silly Bank, okay? All of them in one, Silly Bank. Yes, the dominoes are falling above my pay grade. You are right about that, sir. And thank you very much for the support of the channel. Dan Hedin is in the house. We all need to start the opposite Kramer ETF. You know, I wasn't going get, to gonna, gonna gang up on Kramer because, I mean, I've had my share of bad trades, but, you know, you, you teed me up, Dan, and, and you, you sent me the link today on Twitter. Thank you for that. Jim Kramer was on TV pounding the table on Silicon Valley Bank a month ago saying that it was oversold at, what was it, like $330 at the time. So the inverse Kramer ETF strikes again, doesn't it? Oh, my God, that was really bad. Well, you know, there actually uh, what was the other one? Live on Monday. Can you come back with that, Mish? I'm sorry. The uh, the Kramer, the inverse Kramer actually went live on Monday. Really? So uh, you can trade that now? Yep. Oh, man, that's brutal. If there's ever an, an inverse melon ETF, <laughs> that make me nervous. That make me nervous because the, the inverse melon ETF did all right on the natural gas trade. I can tell you that. I, I did not. I am out of the natural gas trade, by the way, guys. I've mentioned that a couple times in my recent streams. I sold that one yesterday when we crossed below the 20-day exponential moving average, cutting my losses on that trade. Uh, but thank you very much, Dan Hedin. Appreciate it, sir. And thank you for your support on the Patreon page as well. Guys, link down below to Patreon should you feel so inclined. Thank you for everything you guys do for the channel. And Mike Kathman is in the house saying, my work is sluggish. I think the job data is people getting a second job. I think of this channel as family. Thanks, Jack. Well, wow. Thank you, Mike. That was wonderful. Thank you. This is my, my extended melon family here. You guys are awesome. I do, you know, I tell you, I, I, I've mentioned this a few times on the channel. When I first started a YouTube channel, I thought it was just going to be this, me shouting out into the ether, putting my rants out there. Um, I never realized how much would come back. And, and that has been a real pleasant surprise. All the interactions, the various groups, and it's spread beyond YouTube to Twitter and to Patreon and to Discord and some physical meetings at some of these events. You know, I, I just, I have met some amazing, interesting, really sharp, talented people doing this. People from all different walks of life all over the country, and it has been a real pleasure. So thank you, Mike. That was a very wonderful thing to say. I really appreciate that. And yeah, the uh, jobs data, people getting a second job, absolutely. Uh, who is it? Uh, Zero Hedge has been doing a fantastic job of covering that and the deviation between payrolls and households in the jobs numbers. We are seeing the payrolls number climb. The number of positions filled is going up very fast, but the households number is not. The number of employed persons is not rising. And that means people are getting second jobs absolutely right the jobs data is proving that people are getting second jobs thank you mike kathman sir and am i almost caught up not quite yet well, here is steve whitis oh. <laughs> we're trying i'm trying mish steve whitis said how is general liquidity is it getting more difficult for individuals or businesses to get financing from lenders all right that's a good cue up let's talk about liquidity all right i can't speak to private sector lending i don't know what's going on in mortgages right now that data is delayed i don't know what's going on in specific loans. But as far as liquidity in the bond market goes, that's actually looking really good right now. Uh, I'm looking right here at U.S. government bonds and man, across the board in the bond market, these things, the yields are down. And remember, when yields are down, that is prices rising. So people are piling into U.S. treasuries right now. This is a flight to safety, guys. This is that stampede down Exeter's pyramid that I was telling you about. The U.S. 10-year yield down 22 basis points today, or 5.67%. And who's got the biggest one, right? The five-year down 25. Mish, what was the number you gave me earlier today? One of them was... Uh, the two-year and three-year were down 30 basis points each. As far as general liquidity, the um, they've been screaming for people to buy the short end so that the sellers could have room to sell. So if anything, this is helping out the banks and liquidity. Yeah, and that is, this is one of the ways that, you know, a bank failing, if if the government were, as the nukes say, when, when things are happening, hands off the panel and observe, right? Don't, don't go pressing buttons until you know what you're messing with. What's going on right now, what has really sank a lot of these banks 
is the value of these MBSs and these CMBSs has been tanking. And, you know, they, the banks take our money, our deposits, and they buy assets with them. Our money is liabilities. They owe us that money back. So they go buy their assets. They bought mortgage-backed securities, commercial mortgage-backed securities, among other things, and U.S. treasuries, a lot of USTs. And that's their assets. And as long as the assets are worth more than the liabilities, the bank is solvent. Well, with rising interest rates, those assets have declined in value. Remember, bond yields and bond prices inversely correlated. That is a vital relationship you got to understand. And so as interest rates have been rising in this Fed tightening cycle, it's been driving down the value of the bank's assets. It's been making the banks insolvent. And now we're finding out, like is the case with Silly Bank, which won uh, Silicon Valley, <laughs> their assets <laughs> are worth way less than their liabilities. And so the bank has failed. Well, what's going on right now? Everybody is watching this bank failure and they're saying, yikes, get out of stocks or get out of these other things. Get out of this investment. Get out of that investment. Dump your derivatives. And they're running into U.S. Treasuries for safety, right? The U.S. Treasury is still viewed as pristine collateral. It's still viewed as relatively low risk investment. Well, all these people panicking is having the effect of increasing the value of U.S. Treasuries and driving those interest rates lower. Well, this could actually serve to shore up the balance sheet of some of the other banks, assuming this panic can be contained. So what's going on right now is increasing the value of bonds. So it's improving the balance sheets. It's one of the ways that, you know, if you just stop messing with things, it will right itself. The ship will right itself. You just, the problem is our central bankers, these guys, they don't know how to take their hands off the panel and watch. They have to always mess with it. And uh, that comes later. They haven't messed with it yet. Not today, but uh, so liquidity right now, at least in U.S. Treasuries, Steve, is looking better than it looked this morning because people are piling into Treasuries. Now, where's that liquidity coming from? That you need to worry about because other assets, whatever they're selling right now to pile into Treasuries, that's where the liquidity is leaving. And that's the contagion. That's the worry that you have to wonder about. Good thought, Steve. Thank you very much, sir, for the support, support of the channel. And Mr. AK is in the house. What's going on, AK? He says, guess who was the first customer who got Silly Bank into crypto? Barry Silbert and Digital Currency Group. And he yeah. closes with buy gold. Well, we have not heard the last from Mr. Silbert at Digital Currency Group. They are also, they're not in receivership, but they're, did they actually file for bankruptcy, Digital Currency Group? Or are they still, Genesis filed for bankruptcy? No, Genesis filed, DCG has not. Right. And, and DGC is the parent company of Genesis. So Digital Currency Group, not bankrupt, one of their subsidiaries is. And, you know, we were talking a little bit a while ago uh, about, hey, the FTX thing happened in November. And for months, more and more groups were hit by it. Right. And the next one went down, the next domino to fall. Well, we're going to see something similar coming from this silly bank thing. Not Silvergate, not Signature, Silicon Valley Bank. <laughs> It's, I get these wires are crossed, folks. So we're going to be hearing about this for months, much the same way we're talking about Barry Silbert and digital currency right now. They're the fallout from the FTX collapse. And you could even go even further back. The FTX was the fallout from the Celsius collapse. And Celsius was the fallout from the Terra Luna collapse. Contagion. It's how this works, right? We said when crypto was collapsing last summer, we were saying this is the opening innings of a deflationary collapse. The upper, upper levels of Exter's pyramid were failing. The riskiest, most horse manure assets fail first, and then you move down. Now we're out of the crypto space. Most of those went belly up, not all. There's still plenty more to come in crypto. But now we're starting to see the MBS and the CMBS is starting to really sell off. And now it's starting to drag banks down with it. And we've got to wonder, what are the banks dragged down with them? Where does the contagion go from here? Go ahead, Mish. Can you hear a quick story about gold? So the simplified word for bank in Chinese means bank. But if you go to the traditional character that the simplified was made off of, it means house of precious metals. Yeah, that's what the first banks were, right? They were depository institutions where you could leave your gold because they had big, strong guys with big swords to protect it. Your gold could be safe and they would issue you a paper note that was redeemable for gold. So, yeah, banks at, at their earliest days, their, their original roots were places to store your gold. And now we still have banks, but somehow gold has been taken out of the equation. And now banks 
seems like the most powerful banks in the world are almost united in their attempts to suppress the price of gold. Good luck keeping that up for much longer now that the flight to safety is involved, is, is starting. But thank you, AK. I appreciate that very much. Guys, thank you so much for the generosity today, all the super chats and all the support of the channel. I really do appreciate that. And thank you to Rhyme Time UK. He says, thanks for the speedy reporting, gents. Well, you are very welcome, Rhyme Time. We do try our best to stay on top of this. And, uh, you know, I mentioned yesterday, we don't do those spontaneous live streams very often. If we do, it usually means something's up. Something big is up. And, you know, I, that's not a, I don't pull that trigger haphazardly. Usually I only do it if I see that the Dow is down a thousand points or more. But yesterday when I saw banks across the board were down 5%, I knew something was up. And I was in disbelief that nobody would talk to it. So me, me and Mish had a long conversation. Should we, should we go live yesterday afternoon? And finally, we just we said, you know what, let's do it. And uh, I'm glad we did. I mean, because nobody was talking about it. You heard it here, folks. You heard it here first, folks. Remember that. Thank you very much, Rhyme Time UK, sir, for the support of the channel and the kind words. Oh, my God, I cannot keep up with y'all. You guys are keeping me on the hamster wheel today. Mike Kathman is back again. He says, you talked about how Goldman, $30 billion helped our price. How much does 401ks do the same thing? 401ks. I'm not sure 401ks are really are really playing a role right now. I mean, 401ks, that is a huge amount of wealth. I would say the risk of 401ks is the fact that we have got baby boomers in retirement now, right? Most of the boomers are out of work and most of them are living down their assets. So not so much relevant to what's going on with today's banking system, but step way back in the timeline when it comes to 401ks. You've got a huge swath of the population that has a lot of money that is selling financial assets to live off of in retirement right now. And they are being replaced in the market by millennials and Gen Zers who are notoriously lousy savers. And that's not a dig at Gen Zers and millennials. All right. I am I'm not taking a cheap shot at the younger generations right now. The deck is stacked against them through financial repression and the suppression of wages. It's just a fact, though that millennials and Gen Zers are not saving nearly enough. So if you just look at it wholesale from way back, 50,000 foot view, you've got money coming out of the market and none going in to replace it. So the 401ks, that I think is the risk that 401ks and IRAs and pensions pose to markets right now because right now retirement plans are net sellers of all financial assets. That is a big risk to markets and that's going to put downward pressure on asset prices probably for the next decade, maybe two. It depends. I mean, if, there's, if the Gen Zers and the millennials suddenly start taking savings for retirement seriously, but think about the millennials. This is now the second, arguably third major financial crisis that they will have lived through. Are they going to be in a hurry to turn over their money to the financial system? Probably not. So, you know, this is another one of those things that's going to do permanent damage to the reputation of the whole industry. And let's be honest, folks, they deserve it. So thank you, Mike, again. I appreciate so this, the support of the channel. Fourth financial crisis. Fourth. Right, you have com. the one of the late 70s, dot com, housing, and now this one. All right. Well, be careful. If you say late 70s, then you're suggesting somebody born in 1980 is a millennial, and I am clinging to my Gen Exodness very Oh, no, tightly. I'm a Gen X man, but there, I have lived <laughs> Okay, you have. Yeah, I was talking about mainly the millennials who've lived through. Yeah. They were born around the dot-com era. We won't count that one. But they had the GFC, and then they had the uh, unfortunate health situation, which who knows if I can even talk about that now without getting shadow banned. And now you have this one. So a lot of financial, a lot of financial crises for the, uh, the younger generations. And, uh, you know, guys, you don't deserve it. All right? I, I mean, I'll, I'll say it. Like, I'll poke fun at millennials as much as the next guy. Yeah, I've made a few jokes about mom's basement and all that stuff, right? Like, and now to be honest with you, I'm like, I think it's a prudent financial decision to live in mom's basement. You're saving buku bucks and you can be buying up assets on the cheap next year when this sell-off is done. So, I mean, the people who are living in mom's basement right now, as long as they're taking advantage of that cheap living to sock away some cash, they are going to look real smart in a couple of years, all right? So careful with those millennial jokes because very soon they're going to end up owning everything. Anyway, AK is back again. Thank you, AK. He says, Perth Mint sold diluted gold to China. Did I just get shadow banned again? I mentioned China. They sold diluted gold. I did catch that story. 
got caught and tried to cover it up with an article. P.S. It's owned by the Australian government. That's big. Why? All right. I have I haven't covered the Perth Mint story. I'll, I'll comment it on, on on it, but there's a reason why I haven't covered it. I did see the story, and the story was that they were doping their gold. That they were basically that they were diluting the gold that they were selling to China. Now. That sounded like a huge story, and so I wanted to, to run with that one. But then it said later on in that same article that the gold was still 99.99% pure, that it was still 4.9 fine. So if they're diluting their gold, how is it still 4.9 fine? It's possible it was even finer than 4.9 fine, and then they diluted it. But if it's still 4.9 fine, can you really call it diluted gold? And this is why the wording of the article really confused me. And I haven't been able to find anything concrete to say specifically what was the concentration, what was the number of bars. I did see some numbers that saying as much as 9 billion ounces of potentially doped, doping, that was a re- weird word, potentially diluted gold had been sold. But it was, I don't want to say it was misleading. It was just, it was confusing. And I couldn't really get my head around, is there really gold bars out there that are not at least as pure as advertised? And I could not find anything definitive to say, yes, there was. And so since nobody else was really talking about it, the story was losing its luster. And then China came out and said, no, it was fake. We don't have any gold in our vaults that wasn't pure. And well, I guess, yeah, China would say that, right? Because China doesn't, they're selling gold or, you know, they may one day want to sell gold. And so they'd be lighting their own money on fire if they were to come out and admit it. It was really hard to get concrete information on this story. And I don't want to go off half cocked on a story and put out something that's inaccurate and then have to walk it back later. So, so I haven't commented on that one. That's, that is my Perth Mint story. Um, See also when it comes to Perth Mint, they're one of the big culprits of unallocated gold and their pool. Sometimes I'll call it their pooled gold. Um, I don't really have a lot of confidence in Perth Mint, but I didn't want to go run with that article until I had something better. So that's that's why I haven't done a video on that one. It's just been really hard to get reliable information. But you guys, sounds like you guys are pretty well informed whether I cover it or not. So (laughs) impressive. And thank you very much, AK. I appreciate it very much, guys. And KDM is in the house. He says, what are we going to call the next generation after Gen Z? Gen A1? I don't, I don't know. I mean, millennials didn't really get, didn't get a letter. What do you have to do to, to not get a letter? I mean, we were Gen X, and then there was the millennials, so and then there's Gen Z. Gen had a name, right? The silent generation, the boomers. Yep. They don't know about us, right? Because we're not all the same. Like most generations, you can kind of get a generational idea. Then they got the name. Millennials got the name because Gen Y is stupid. And then you get Gen Z. Not? They don't have them yet, right? They're probably going to be the Zoomers. Or yeah, something I, like I that, think right? Zoomers had as much to do with work from home as it did the letter. And it fit the Z. So maybe that's right. why. Well, now we got Generation Alpha is being born right now. So they probably won't get a name for you know, 10, 15 years. Hmm. They will be the next greatest generation or mm-hmm. I don't know, the, the greatest third generation because the world is going to be so messed up by the time they're in charge that they're going to have no choice but to be awesome. So good news, girls. You're going to be awesome. Bad news is it's going to really suck for you. Sorry, ladies. Did what we could with the place, but uh, we, we play the hand we're dealt. Good question, KDM. Provocative thought from the Melon Heads today. And I think we finally caught up. We did. We finally caught up. That was a daunting task. All right, let's see what the markets are doing. Are they? We got eleven minutes left of trading, and we are just getting through the indexes right now. The S and P is down one point seven two percent, just barely off the lows of the day, down one point seven five percent. Let's see what's we got. The Dow is down four hundred and forty six, also just barely off the lows of the day, or one point three eight percent at thirty one thousand eight hundred and eight, and that's on top of the five hundred and change it dropped yesterday. And the NASDAQ leading the way lower, down 2.33% or 2.06% at 11,105. Now, let's talk about the NASDAQ for a second. 
because this is something I don't know if any of the names in NASDAQ are specifically impacted by the silly bank situation. Silicon Valley. I, I have to do a double take and make sure I'm thinking of the right bank because they all start with SI. All right. So silly bank goes under. They were a startup in Silicon Valley focused bank. And I want to show you this because I saw this on Twitter and this made me go, oh boy. This is in Bloomberg at Silicon Valley Bank, north of 93% of the bank's $161 billion in deposits are uninsured per a regulatory filing. All right, now, first of all, I had heard that there was $209 billion of deposits, so it's possible that the $161 may be what's left after the bank run of the last few days. So the numbers are flying around right now. I haven't had a chance to vet these numbers, but if accurate, that's huge. 93% of $161 billion is uninsured because that means as this bank goes into FDIC receivership, right now the people who have money in the bank who have more than $250,000 in any account, and if you want, go back to that bank bail-in video that I did last week for some specifics, that means that they are going to bail in the bank. Right? Bailouts are no longer a thing. Taxpayers are not going to save Silly Bank here. Taxpayers aren't going to do it. Who's going to save them? The depositors. And who are the deposits? depositors at Silicon Valley Bank? Silicon Valley companies. There are a lot of tech startups, a lot of venture capital money is now frozen at this bank. And when they sell off the bank's assets, they're not going to have enough money to pay all the depositors back. So a lot of these companies are going to lose their money. So this is really going to hurt Silicon Valley, it's going to hurt Northern California, San Francisco. It's going to hurt the NASDAQ companies, all the companies, I mean, big tech startups. Those are your NASDAQ names. So this is going to spill over into tech. And I think that's why the NASDAQ, which tends to be the riskier of the indexes, I think that's why they're selling off particularly hard. And that's one of the reasons why you need to wonder about who's next, what's next, who is getting wiped out by this silly bank collapse. And it's going to be Silicon Valley companies. It's going to be a lot of tech startups because these companies, they, they burn through a lot of cash. They can't access the debt market now because interest rates are so high. It's too expensive for them to borrow. And now their cash that they have been able to raise so far is frozen. What are they going to do? Are they going to issue more stock? Are they going to sell more shares into this lousy market where valuations are being dragged out? I don't know. So that's one of the ways. That, that's why I'm saying now what? In the thumbnail, this is one of the things you need to worry about. Who is going to be wiped out by this? A lot of tech startups are not going to recover from this because they are going to lose their money because they're going to bail in the bank. Instead of the taxpayers, it's coming from depositors. When you have money at the bank, if you have money in excess of FDIC insurance in any bank account with any bank, then you are an unsecured and uninsured creditor of that bank. So be wary of that one, guys. Well, and, I think uh, we even talk about FDIC here for a second. Okay. It's not like FDIC has this big chunk of money sitting in a bank somewhere. They have to get Congress to authorize the insurance payment, right? Uh, so they do. there is a fund, uh, but it is a fund, nowhere near it, enough. It's small. Yeah, you're right. That's kind of what I'm getting at. There's a small fund there. It's one bank will wipe that thing out. So Congress is going to have to give them more money. We can't yep. borrow money right now. So they, the FDIC collects their money in the form of their fees that they charge to the banks that they insure. And I think it's called the DIR, the Depository Insurance. No, the DIF, the Depository Insurance Fund. And I, I can't remember what the number was, but it is, it's probably going to be enough to cover Silly Bank here. I don't, especially if so many of these deposits are uninsured. I mean, they're saying 93% of the $161 billion is not insured. So they're not going to need to spend $161 billion to bail out this bank because most of that money is just poof. It's just gone. So I think the FDIC fund will be enough to cover this. And maybe it's enough to cover a few, but it's not going to be enough to cover them all if the contagion spreads. That's a big if. All right. I, you know, again, I want, to, I want to keep myself honest here. This is not 1929 yet. All right. This could be 1929, but it is not yet. All right, that's important. We have one bank that has failed. We have another one that has closed its doors and is likely to fail. And then there's a handful of others who are in dire straits right now. All right, so that's the current status. And beyond that is speculation. 
All right, and I could speculate till I'm red in the face. I'm just going to try not to do that. Uh, all right, so that was that one. Where were we? We we had left off on the Nasdaq. Now let's look at the DXY. 104.61 on the DXY, 70 basis points lower. I was a little surprised to see the DXY heading lower this morning after we got that jobs number, which, by the way, that just got totally lost in the headlines today. The jobs number was supposed to be the biggest story of the week. It's not. Uh, so I saw the jobs number, and I saw the dollar heading south, and I remember saying to Mish, hey, this doesn't make sense. Strong jobs report. You'd think a more aggressive Fed, the, doc, the Dixie should be rallying. Well, what I didn't realize at the time was that Silly Bank was going into FDIC receivership, and that's probably why the dollar was selling off. That was the flight to safety. That was people piling into treasuries. That's why yields going lower, dollar going lower. That, so that was a little interesting to see that this morning. That kind of made me do a double take. Uh, the bonds right now still selling off. The 10-year yield down 23 basis points, 5.86% at 3.693. And if you want to know what a flight to safety looks like, folks, this is a flight to safety. Look at these red candles right here. If, if you've been following this channel for a while, and you know, you've been seeing, I was talking about the resistance at 4%. I drew this line and I've been mentioning, hey, you know, it looks like the Fed's going higher for longer. It looks like rates are going to keep rising. And I said, we're probably going to go to 4%. We're going to meet some resistance there because it's a psychological barrier. And you know, look, we were buttoned up against 4%. We broke above it, failed the retest. For a couple of days, we were threatening to go above that 4% number. And then yesterday happened in the banks. And look at this, uh-uh, panic, stampede into safety. That is a flight to safety, folks. And uh, that's what we're seeing right now. People are selling out of risky assets. They're dumping tech stocks. They're dumping mortgage-backed securities. They're dumping CMBS. And they're piling into U.S. Treasuries for safety. And the best place to hide is the long end of the yield curve. It's driving these interest rates lower. Coincidentally, this may be what shores up the balance sheets at some of these banks. Because as these interest rates are heading lower, those bond prices are heading higher. I got a couple of folks I got to catch up with here. Uh, Mitch, do me a favor. Make sure I didn't miss anybody. I am at vacation time right now who said he thinks the Fed will once again save the banks. No, it won't be the Fed. It'll be the FDIC. It'll be the depositors. It'll be us. Let inflation run hot by cutting rates. By the way, today has had the highest trading volume all year. Okay, I didn't know that about the volume. Thank you, vacation time, for that data point. That is a good data point that we've had the highest volume. I suspect we're seeing a spike in the VIX. I haven't looked at the VIX today. But that's probably up along with that volume. Um, as far the first half, will the Fed once again save the banks and let inflation run hot by cutting rates? So there's a lot to unpack in there. You got to understand the direction of markets is going to be determined by the net of forces acting on it, right? You you have just like an object in motion, right? It's determined by the net forces acting on it, which direction it's going to move, if at all. You've got inflationary forces and you've got deflationary forces and whichever is greater, that's the direction the market's going to move. I can tell you right now, this bank failure, you know, we just saw 160 some odd billion dollars, maybe 150 of that is uninsured. That's money going up in smoke. That's deflationary, all right? Or at the very least, that is disinflationary. That is money disappearing, money out of circulation. So, what we're seeing today, this banking collapse, this is a deflationary event. Now, is it going to be enough to stop the inflation? I don't know. Probably not. Inflation's pretty high. And by stop inflation, I mean bring it back to the Fed's arbitrary 2% target, which if you ask me, it should be 0%, but that's a discussion for a whole other day. Now, will the Fed once again save banks? So this is interesting and depends on, you know, we'll channel Obi-Wan Kenobi here. It depends on your point of view. No, the Fed will not save banks, at least not on paper, right? No more taxpayer bailouts. So the, the, the Treasury will not save the banks. That is in the law. I can tell you the Treasury won't save the banks, but maybe they will because we have this depository insurance fund that we talked about. They've got money set aside to cover this. Well, what happens if that's not enough to cover the banks that fail? Well, now where does the money come from? Well, according to the law, that comes from the U.S. Treasury. So now the U.S. Treasury has to borrow money in order to bail out, not bail out, in order to bail in the banks, right? The, the depositors who are FDIC insured up to their $250,000, that money would come from the U.S. Treasury if the deposit insurance fund couldn't cover it. 
Well, where's the Treasury going to get it from? They're already operating at a deficit, so they're going to have to borrow it. It's going to come from the bond market. So let's play this out, sequence of events. Where does that money then come from? Well, you know, if, if we have more bond supply, if more bonds are dumped on the market so the government can borrow more money, well, that's going to put downward pressure on bond prices. That's going to drive interest rates higher. Well, one of the things that's killing banks right now is these high interest rates. So if the FDIC insurance is relied on by too many banks and it goes to the Treasury to bail out the FDIC so they can bail out the bank customers, not the banks, well, then the Federal Reserve is most likely going to have to turn on the printing press to quantitatively ease and buy those bonds in order to suppress the yields on them to prevent the next bank from failing. So there was a lot of dotted lines and a lot of sequence of events there, vacation time, but eventually we did get to the Fed bailing out the banks, didn't we? We did get there. So the whole design of the bail-in process and the Dodd-Frank Act was meant to prevent the taxpayer bailouts, but it's six one, half dozen the other. Ultimately, it ends up being the same thing. The little guy takes it on the chin and the big guys get rewarded for their bad decisions. That has been constant throughout history. And it has not changed just because corrupt, powerful people passed a new law that said they're not going to do it anymore. They will change it the second it suits them. So good comment. You sent me down a couple of tangents there, vacation time, but I think we got there eventually. I, do, I think we got there. And I think okay, there was one more. Yep. AK is back. Yeah, uh, so I am caught up, Mish? All right. You are caught up. <laughs> AK says, show me your Patreon times cost house." Shill me your Patreon times, cost how Zoom, or what shill away, sir? There are no, there are no commas in there. Shill me your Patreon yeah. time, cost, and how Zoom. My Patreon times cost how Zoom. So, like, what am I... we uh, it costs $9 a month. We do Zooms once okay. a week, live Zoom okay. calls. Um, you're there a lot. I'm there half the time because yeah. I forget. Um, so and Zoom, then, if I if I see something going on in in markets that is like urgent, I mean it it takes me at a minimum four hours to make a video, and that's like just like pop up my melon on a thing and just talk right between production, filming, create a thumbnail, type a description, tag it, upload it to YouTube. It's a four hour endeavor. All right, if I see something urgent and I don't have a minimum of four hours. Or I think it needs to be said. Sometimes I'll just post that thing right up on Patreon. All right. So you you do kind of, we can call it a little bit of an early warning system. All right. But I mean, ultimately, Patreon, it was requested that I start a Patreon. I had a lot of people back in 2021, late 2021, who demanded that I start a Patreon. So I started it. <laughs> and it was never like part of the plan for the channel. People asked for it. So I gave it to them. And then, you know, we started sharing some ideas on Patreon, and I was enjoying the back and forth. So I just decided, you know what, we're, we're going to add this thing in where once a week we're going to get together on Zoom, and it's just AMA, Ask Me Anything, Q&A. So that kind of became a little bit of a ritual. We, we move it around. Every week on Wednesday we do it. We talk for 30 to 40 minutes, um, and you know, it's, it's more informal. It's more back and forth. I'll usually open it up for questions for anybody have anything that's on their mind at the start of the meeting. Uh, so we do that once a week. And, uh, you know, if you guys have questions, you send them to me. I answer all the emails I get on Patreon. So that that is my shill for Patreon. But, you know, look, guys, times are tough. If you want to support the channel, we would love to have you over there. Absolutely fantastic. If you can't, I'm just glad you're watching. Let's put it that way. And there is a link down below, should you feel so inclined. That's as much shilling as I do here, folks. I am a lousy salesman. All right, M&J is probably yelling at me right now. She's probably in front of her keyboard, my blue wrench M&J, who is awesome, by the way. She's saying, no, Jack, no, sell, sell, sell. <laughs> Sorry, M&J, got to be me. But so that is my shill for Patreon. Thank you, AK. I appreciate that very much. And no, that was not scripted. We didn't set that up. I have not met AK in real life. But thank you. That was very generous of you, sir. And Joe is here, says, finally starting to get exciting I've been sitting in cash, dividends, and shiny stuff for over a year. I was getting bored. Thanks for what you do. Joe, I have been doing almost exactly that. I have been sitting in largely, largely cash. I have my automated investment schedule that I do. I buy a little bit of Bitcoin. I buy a little bit of metal on a regular basis. But for the most part, I've been sitting in cash for a while because I knew this was coming. And I've been eating that cost of inflation to sit in cash. So, you know, even if you've lost zero dollars, 
You've lost money. You've lost purchasing power with this inflation. But I, I believe the worst is yet to come. I do believe this deflationary event is only in its early innings. The thing is, if for, for you guys who are doing what I'm doing, if you're sitting in cash, all right, if you hear that the Fed is turning on the printer again, if you hear that they are going to intervene in markets or create special purpose vehicles to support certain asset classes or whatever wishy-washy statement the Fed uses, which basically means burr, if Fed go burr, then it's time to deploy that cash, okay? So now I can't tell you what to do. I'm not allowed. The law doesn't let me tell you guys what to do. And honestly, I get uncomfortable when people ask me specifically, what should I do with my money? Because it, it's, it's a weird psychological thing that happens with me. Uh, but I'm not allowed to tell you what to do with your money. Uh, you need a special piece of paper, a special permission slip from the government to tell people what to do with their money. And in order to get that piece of paper, you have to tell people what the government wants you to tell people to do with their money, which is usually lend it to the government. That's how you get the permission slip from the government to tell people what to do with their money. As long as you tell them, turn it over to Uncle Sam and let him be responsible for it, you can get that permission. So I don't have that permission. So, you know, if I get a little like, oh, we don't do financial advisor, and that's why all these guys on FinTube are saying, this isn't financial advice, I'm not a financial advisor, do your own, do you do your own research, arrive at decisions right for you based on your unique situation. That is legal CYing my A because the government says you need permission from us to tell people what to do with their money. So all I do is I talk about what I do with my money and then I analyze what I see in the charts and the numbers. And I always tell you guys, challenge my thinking, challenge what I tell you. Go out there, find somebody who's telling you the opposite of what I'm saying and decide who you want to believe. And you're not going to hurt, hurt my feelings if it's not me. All right. This is not an echo chamber. I don't do echo chambers. So challenge me if you think I'm wrong. Tell me about it. And I promise to at least read it. <laughs> I, I can't say I'm going to agree with you. All right. I can sometimes be a little dismissive. I'm a pretty arrogant guy. Anybody with a YouTube channel is. I'll at least admit to it. Most won't. But, uh, you know, like Mitch, like Mish with his 50 basis point rate hike. And I was like very immediately dismissive of it back when the February or the January CPI came out. And uh, well, well, let's talk about that one, Mish. What are we at right now on the 50 basis point hike? Let, I have that thing queued up here. We are now looking at... Wow, we're down. Look at that. That was over 80 this morning. It's now 38% likelihood of a 50 basis point rate hike. Wow. And that, that is was all over. the bank. Yep. That was not the jobs number that did that, folks. And remember what we said. If the pivot is coming... That's not good news. That means something really bad happened. Well, something really bad happened. A big bank failed. And now the likelihood of the pivot, or at least now we're closer to a pivot, right? We're less hawkish than we were this morning. That's because something really bad happened. So, uh, How did I get on there? Oh, he was talking about cash and cash dividends. And that, you know, that's going to be the signal. If Fed go burr, you guys who are sitting in cash, that's going to be your signal. Okay. And, uh, you know, I'll call it like I see it when I, if and when that happens it's not guaranteed that that happens let me just say that you know Jerome Powell his legacy may be he's the fed governor who destroyed the money printer right he could be mike bolton from office space with the louisville slugger and the printer you know and the, the sequence with the music playing god i love that movie i love that whole sequence right <laughs> and then Jerome then Powell like gets rid of the bat and he's like i'm fine i'm fine i'm fine and then he runs at it and he starts bare knuckle bashing the money printer that could be Jerome Powell. That may be the legacy he wants. And God bless him if it is. I would love him for it if he did. I would take back every nasty thing I ever said about those gargantuan fuzzy caterpillars that park on top of his eyes. I'll take it all back if he destroys the money printer. He could do that. He probably won't. He will be under immense pressure to turn on the money printer again. But he's a hawk. And he's, he's a conservative. He's not a Keynesian. Not an Austrian, I don't think either, but, you know, he, he may not turn the money printer back on. It's not a given. He probably will, but let's at least entertain the non-zero likelihood that he doesn't turn the money printer back on. And if that's the case, you want to be in cash because you are going to see the value of every asset in the world tank if that happens. And you'll be sitting on all that 2021 cash and everybody else will not. And you'll be buying everything up for pennies on the dollar. You will be the new royalty when that happens. But that is if J-Pow goes bare-knuckle brawl 
on the money printer, which he may not do. All right. I think I'm almost caught up here. Where am I? You're at Robon. Uh, I got AK in the show me away. This is hilarious super chats, by the way. You guys are awesome today. I got Joe, and I'm on Mike, right? Yep. There he is. Hey, Mike. How are we doing today? Mike says, remember, FDIC max, 250K split. That is fantastic. That's right. Uh, check out that F that video I did about bank balance. It's the one that's got Jamie Dimon's mug. He's kind of tilted in the thumbnail. Um, everything you know need to know about balance. The cutoff is 250000 but that is per person, per ownership category, per bank. There's nuance to it. So you can get more than 250000 in FDIC coverage at the same bank if your accounts are in a certain set up in a certain way if it's joint accounts and single accounts or if it's in one category and a different category so pay attention to the nuance in the fdic regulations about that insurance and but what it comes down to 250k that's the important cutoff all right and look if you've got more than two hundred and fifty thousand dollars in your checking account then congratulations you've got more than two hundred and fifty thousand dollars in your checking account great perhaps you know it's a great problem to have if you got that problem if you got two, more than two hundred fifty thousand dollars in a checking account at Silly Bank, can't help you. Sorry, S O L. If that's you, but thank you very much, Mike, for that very important reminder. And you're right, guys. Watch that two hundred fifty k. Don't put all your eggs in that one basket. Spread out your risk, everybody. It's all about minimizing risk in an environment like this. And Joe is back. He says, "I've also been taking little bites from those ISO two zero zero two two coins. I don't know what those are." Do you know it's what like, that is, Mitch? Well, ISO 9001, I, I assume it's one of those things. I'll look it up. Interesting. I don't, I, I don't know what that is. So I can't comment on that one. You got me. You got me, Joe. I'm not going to go off half cock on something I don't know jack about. So I, I cannot combine. Well, good luck with your ISO 20,022 coins. It's the best I can do. Oh, okay. <laughs> go ahead, Mitch. It's what a, are they? Yeah, it's a collection of compliant digital coins and tokens that satisfy standards of ISO that those numbers. But they're they're digital coins, so they're they're cryptos. They're are they proof of? Does it say if it's proof of work, proof of stake? Um, I will look. All right, all right. Well, good luck with your. You got me, man. I I had no idea what that was. That. I've been stumped before. I've been asked about things that I wasn't sure about before, but that's the first time when I've been asked and I'm just like outright, I have no idea what that is. So 100 million melon coin to Mr. Joe for playing stump the dummy. You got me something I don't know anything about. Enjoy your 100 million melon coins. Just as soon as I get those things done and printed over at the melon mint, they will be yours. And don't worry, those are totally, totally financially strong over at uh, Melon Head Bank. Don't worry. Yeah, they just and have Mr. to Mike. have all the right rules followed. Bitcoin can be one, but also a crypto coin could be one. So it's both. Okay, so it's an international standard for cryptocurrencies. Mm -hmm. Yep. Now we got standards for everything. How standard? Mike Kathman says cash or gold, both. I don't do any one or the other. I, I don't. I don't view it as binary. Right? You need cash to live. You know, I, I had this conversation with a buddy of mine from college today. You know. You can't run to the bank, get all, get all your money out and put it in your mattress. you got to pay your gas bill. you got to pay your electric bill. And unless you're going to drive all over the greater metropolitan area where you live to pay all of your bills in cash every month, you need money in a bank to function in this world. All right, There are, there are very few people who are totally off-grid who have managed that existence. And I'm sure it's a very wholesome, fulfilling existence. I'm not there. And, you know, I'm very in touch with my natural roots. I'm kind of an old-fashioned kind of guy, but, like, I still need my cash in the bank. So you need both. And as far as gold, uh, yeah, you want to have gold. You want to have some exposure to gold, but you also need to have yourself covered. You, you need to make sure you got money to buy food. I mean, I'm trying to think, how do I... How do I phrase it? The answer is both. It's not It's not one or the other. It's not a binary thing, right? Gold protects you from an inflationary, hyperinflationary scenario. If, if J-PAL go burr, gold protects you from that. If J-PAL don't go burr, if J-PAL goes Mike Bolton on the printer, right, then you want cash. So 
you need both. You want to be protected from both scenarios. You want to be hedged. You want to have something that does well under scenario A, but you also want something that does well under scenario B. If you pick one and you put everything into one, then that's a binary bet of your entire net worth. And if it doesn't go your way, you're wiped out. So you can't position yourself like that. So it's, I'm not going to bite on the, you know, would you rather one or the other? I'm going to say both. All right. Um, yeah, that's where I live. I live both. Thank you, Mike, very much. But it's another one. You kind of tripped me up a little bit there. Uh, Dan Hedin is back and says, Jack, do you have your required pieces of flair? Well, Dan Hedin, if you feel that wearing the minimum 15 pieces of flair is how you want to express yourself, well, then I can't help that. How's my, uh, how's my passive aggressive Mike Judge? All right, extra credit. What was the name of the restaurant? Somebody write it down in, in the comments. First person to get it gets 100 million melon coin. What was the name of the restaurant and office space where you were required to wear at least a minimum of 15 pieces of flair, you know, to express yourself? Anyone? Anyone? Thank you very much, Dan Hedin. Awesome movie reference. Awesome, awesome quote. And Grumpa's in the house. If a TD Ameritrade bank goes under, TD Ameritrade is a brokerage. Toronto, Toronto Dominion is the bank. One, two different. Okay, but go on. If TD Ameritrade... Bank goes under. What happens to the brokerage accounts and stock holdings and money markets? So my DD on the FDIC did not cover brokerage accounts. I can tell you in a TD Ameritrade, I, you're going to want to verify this, but I believe the money market funds where the cash in a TD Ameritrade is kept is FDIC insured. And I believe it's in the name. I believe they say FDIC insured money market funds. So it, the money market, the cash in your TDA is covered under those 250000 uh insurance from the FDIC. Now, as far as the shares and, you know, if TD Ameritrade goes belly up, now what happens to the custodianship of your shares? That falls under different statutes, and I don't know the specifics of that one. I, I can't comment on that, but I do know there is some type of insurance and some type of law governing that insurance, but it's not the FDIC. It's a totally different set of rules. A lot of them are set up to mirror the FDIC. Uh, but, I, man, you guys are kicking my butt today with all the stuff that I don't have very good answers to. You're asking the right questions, guys. You're, asking the, you're, you're all asking the right questions. Thank you very much, Grandpa, sir. I appreciate it. But, again, I'm pretty sure the money market fund on TD Ameritrade is covered, but you're going to want to verify that. Go click go click on the Ask Me the Help Ask, is this money market in my brokerage FDIC insured up to $250,000? you will get the answer. So thanks again, Grumpa. I appreciate that. And uh, all right, so real quick, I promise you guys I was, was going to give you some names. Shenanigans. Shenanigans? Was it No, Shenan that was police. Uh, wait, that was Super Troopers. It was not shenanigans. So it was Trotsky's. Chachkis. Who got Chachkis? Grandpa. Grandpa? All right, Grandpa. You stumped me and you got it. So 200 million melon coin to Mr. Grandpa for Chachkis and for stumping me on the question. Yeah, Shenanigans was the uh, the name of the restaurant in uh, Super Troopers when the chief said he was going to pistol whip the next guy who said Shenanigans. And they'll say, uh, hey, Farva, what's the name of that restaurant with all the doohickeys, the bells and whistles you like? He says, well, what do you mean, Shenanigans? Oh... <laughs> Great movie. Great movie. I am a child of cinema, folks. All right. I promised you guys at the start of the stream that we were going to talk about some of the names you got to watch for right now. So we're going to talk about some of those names real quick because I've been going for over an hour. But you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to help myself, myself to a little bit extra time today because of exigent circumstances. These circumstances, if these are not exigent, then I submit none are. Signature Bank is the first one everybody's talking about. you got to watch out for SBNY. Now, they are mostly on people's radar because Signature supposedly has a lot of exposure to cryptocurrency. So keep an eye on Signature Bank. Their stock down 22, almost 23% today. Check out a five-day chart on Signature. They were $114 at the start of the week. They are now at 70. All right, so this stock has been sent to the woodshed by this situation. Another one to watch out for, this is one I hadn't really heard of before today, Western Alliance Bank Corp, down 20% today. I keep seeing this one pop up. This is more of a regional bank. They were Their stock was at $76, and they went as low as 31 today. Now they're back up at 49. Now, the, these guys got halted. A couple of these names got halted earlier today. Now, the, 
the reason why you got to worry about the stocks, all right, and this is why the stocks could be trouble, is because let's say these banks do have problems. Let's say you're a Western Alliance Bank Corp customer and you see that their stock is down. You probably, you might say, oh, I'm worried about my money might not be safe. So you go withdraw a few grand from your Western Alliance account. And I'm not saying go do this. So it's hypothetical, all right? You pull some money out. Well, now they need to sell off some of their assets in order to pay their liabilities, which is your money as a liability at the bank. So that adds selling pressure to their assets. That devalues what they have. Now, if there's too much pressure on asset prices, which there is right now, the banks slowly are becoming insolvent. Now, a bank can write itself a couple of different ways. They can borrow money, but nobody wants to lend money to a bank that just dropped by 20%. Plus, if they are, the interest rates on that loan is going to be very expensive. So it's hard for banks to raise money by borrowing right now. Another way a bank can raise capital is by issuing shares, by diluting their shareholders. That's what Silly Bank tried to do, Silicon Valley. The problem is when your stock is already down 40 or 50% over the last few days, well, now selling shares, you got to sell, you got to issue twice as many shares to raise, raise the same money. So as borrowing costs rise, as these stocks are beaten down, it's harder for these banks. The lifelines available to them are becoming fewer and fewer, even as the run on deposits gets worse and worse. So that's why this is a psychological thing right now. The banking system needs to assure the public that they got this. I don't know if they're going to do it or not. Right now, these stocks are still getting crushed, so they have not been able to assure the public of this yet. Another name you want to watch out for, First Republic Bank. This one also got halted today, down 14%. They were way down this morning. They were down at $47 at 9.48 this morning. Right now, they're back up at 81. Looking at a one-month chart, this was $134 stock a few weeks ago. All right, so these are some of the names you want to watch out for. Here's another one. Did we talk about Western Alliance? We talked about WAL already. And by the way, yesterday when we spoke, when I did my spontaneous live stream, this sell-off was not affecting the European banks. They were down a fraction of a percent yesterday. Some of them were up. Not today. Today, the sell-off reached the European banks also. We got Deutsche Bank down 7% today at $11. We got HSBC down 3.7% today. UBS down 2.9% today, all right? JP Morgan is up. Go figure, JPM is up. I don't know why JPM would be up today, but the sell-off has reached the folks overseas. So that's that's a couple of the names to watch out for, and that's a couple of the, uh, the contagion risks. I saw a couple more. You guys are still just pouring in with the supers. We are going to keep going. Where are you guys? We're starting at AK. Uh, Starting at AK, or AK was the last one that I got? Uh, no, AK will be the first one you need to get. Okay, I got this. the diluted gold. There's a lot of comments to scroll through. Okay, oh, I went I went back too far. We're, we're at the Gen Z thing here. Go a little bit faster. <laughs> Vacation time, come on. Man, you guys are jamming today. We got Joe already. There's Mike with the FDIC. There's AK. All right, now we're almost caught up. Mike Kathman, cash or gold? I already got you. Answer was both, Mike. And I got Dan Hedin. I got Grandpa. Who's left? You got three more. You got AK and then Mike and Jesse. All right. AK, ISO 2022, government docs on the net. You need to look into it. It's bad. It's not crypto, as you know. It's bad, bad, bad. Chain to the block was going to be ISO 2025, but they moved it up. All right. So you're telling me it's bad. Bad, Go bad, get bad. The next one because, Mike, the next one also talks about the same subject. Okay. AK is, is sounding the alarm pretty good. And Mike Mike is chiming in here. All right, Mike Mike. And thank you very much. AK for all the support today. Mike Mike says, you have to do some research on ISOs. They are currently testing CBDCs on certain compliant blockchain technologies. I knew XRP was probably going to be the platform that they used to launch their CBDCs on, but I didn't realize it was the ISO numbers that they were, they were creating the standards for it. So it's got to do with CBDCs. Now it's starting to fall into place, guys. XDC and XLM, I'm not familiar with those two. I do know about XRP, though. Uh, all right, I'm going to have to look into these. 
I'm going to have to look at what is buried in these standards. Fantastic information today. Thank you, uh, AK, and thank you, Mike Mike, for the information on this. ISO 2022. I'm going to I'm writing it down, guys. It's going on the board. More homework for the weekend. And Jesse B is here. Say hi, Jesse B. He says, during the GFC, we shorted some inverse ETFs like SRS. Would have made a killing, but the powers that be diluted the shares and killed the short. Yeah, always be careful of that one. Um, I, I'm not familiar with that specific fund. Um, but first of all, the inverse ETFs, especially the levered inverse ETFs, you got to be careful with those things. They're designed to lose money. So when you're right, you 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 make money. But when you're wrong, you're wrong big. So be careful in those levered inverse ETFs. I have dabbled in them before, and I have made money in them before. But they're terrible places to park your money and walk away. So you have to babysit those trades if you're going to get into them. All right? That's the one thing. Uh, and as far as, you know, if you're making money shorting, keep in mind what happened to the meme stocks. Keep in mind what happened to GameStop, to AMC. If the shorts start making money, or not even the shorts, if retail starts making money, they will change the rules mid-game to their benefit. All right, so stay nimble when that happens. All right, and look, don't fight them. I mean, as much as I hate to, hate to say it, they will rob you in broad daylight and they will say you're welcome while they do it on TV and nothing will happen to them. Nobody went to jail for taking away the buy button from the meme stocks. All right, it's one of the most blatantly corrupt, broad daylight things I've ever seen. They shamelessly did it in front of the whole world with everybody watching and nothing happened to them. It was every bit as bad as the, uh, you know, Epstein... Every maybe maybe not every bit as bad. I mean, obviously, what that guy did was worse. But the shamelessness of it, how blatantly corrupt and criminal it was, and the way they just didn't even bother to hide it, it was really eye opening. So be careful with that one. But look, you can make money in a bear market, guys. You can make money going up. You can make money going down. Um, just be careful how you do it. That's the only thing. Do your research and those levered ETFs. Be careful in those levered ETFs. Don't park your money and walk away. All right, they're designed to lose money over time. Thank you very much. That was a good comment from Jesse B. Appreciate that. And I'm all caught up. All right. There's a couple of things I saw on Finchwit today that I want to get to. We're getting a little long in the tooth on this stream, but we got the weekend ahead of us. You guys are going to have time to catch up on this one. So a couple of things I saw. We went to this Bloomberg one. Uh, I saw this one from Inside Paper. This image here, it's a little hard to see, but this is Silicon Valley Bank is now the second largest bank collapse in U.S. history. Only Washington Mutual was bigger. Now, keep in mind, Lehman Brothers, they were $620 billion, something like that, when Lehman Brothers collapsed. But that was an investment bank. That wasn't like a savings and loan bank. So I think they're not including the investment banks in this list. So as far as like just traditional banks goes, Silicon Valley Bank, the second biggest bank failure in American history. I thought that was noteworthy at $209 billion. And check this one out from Dirty Bubble Media. Um, by the way, this guy has been excellent, this Mike Burgersberg. He's done a lot of the homework. He's been behind a lot of the DD that has sunk some of these crypto frauds. So you should be following Dirty Bubble Media on Twitter if you're not already. Check this one out. Circle held undisclosed sum at Silicon Valley Bank. If you're not familiar, Circle, they own USDC. That is the second largest stablecoin in the world by dollar value. They had money in Silicon Valley Bank. We don't know how much. As of their last attestation, they had $11.4 billion in reserves in cash. That's not to say that $11.4 billion was all at Silly Bank, but they did have $11.4 billion in cash. And then my buddy, Kirian Von Hess, there's Deso again. I've been referencing him a lot lately. He found this one in one of Circle's latest attestations. Man, Kirian is good, guys. you got to be following him. Cash held at U.S. regulated financial institutions for USDC. This is the cash that is backing up the reserves for stable coins, and it's held at some of these banks, Bank of New York Mellon, Citizen Trust Bank, Customers Bank, New York Community Bank, Flagstar Bank, Signature Bank, uh-oh, Silicon Valley Bank, uh-oh, they're dead, Silvergate Bank, uh-oh, they're dead. So Circle, you know, when we're talking about contagion, who's next, what's next, who's affected, who lost money? Circle lost some money at least in this, we don't know how much. We know they had $11.4 billion in cash as of their last attestation. And some of that cash was in these risky banks, Silvergate, Silicon Valley, and Signature, a.k.a. the Silly Banks. So Circle, potentially affected. That means 
you know, you could argue that this bank collapse was caused by crypto and the collapse at FTX, and it spilled over into TradFi. Well, now it's going to spill back over into crypto, possibly. Full circle here. No pun intended. But I'll take it. I like puns. Why not? Something else. Again, we're looking at Kyrian. Uh, first, let me read the initial one. He's saying lots of startups are missing payroll in the next two to four weeks if Silicon Valley Bank doesn't have the deposits or is SVB doesn't get sold, which they didn't get sold. They're in receivership now. Or if they aren't rescued and they aren't going to get rescued. So what this guy is saying is a lot of startups are going to miss their payrolls in the next two to four weeks. That means layoffs. That means more job cuts. Pay attention, housing market. And then Kyrian comes in and says, oh, it's much worse. They say they have deposits just locked up in illiquid stuff. And that stuff will now get sold regardless. And they'll take a 15-ish percent loss, which will come out of the bond and the equity holders. Not so bad. But the stuff they sell and everyone else still has drops in value further. And that's important. As these banks get liquidated, as they're forced to sell their assets in order to make their depositors whole or partially whole, well, they're selling assets that other people have, that other banks own. This is contagion. So by driving, by selling these assets, selling their mortgage-backed securities and their CMBS for whatever cash they can reclaim, that's going to drive down the value of those assets. That's going to make the balance sheet at the other banks even worse. So Kirian is talking about contagion here. This is some of the stuff on Fintwit, and you're not going to hear about this on CNBC because they don't want you to know because they don't want you to get scared and go take your money out of the bank. So the establishment financial press will not talk about these things. And I saw this one here. This is on the Kobayisi letter. And they're saying there have been massive shifts in Fed expectations as Silly Bank collapses. Futures now see a 40% chance of a 50 basis point rate hike in March, down from 80%. However, there are now five cuts by July of 2024 expected. Market futures seem to believe that the Fed broke the system this week. And that's a pretty good place to leave it off right there, isn't it? The Fed finally broke something, and we've been saying they're going to hike until something breaks. Today, folks, something broke. That's from the Kobayashi letter on Twitter. Miss, you had your hand up. Were you agreeing, or were you going to chime in? Uh, I think you're muted, Mish. I was going to say, you're off mute. Yeah, you have two super chats. Oh, two super chats. Okay. I got my man Skip H says, can banks raid your safe deposit box in a bailout? Uh, it is a bail-in, and I believe safe deposit boxes are not protected. I Check with your specific financial institution, but the FDIC, all the statutes and everything I read, and that was riveting stuff. And by riveting, I mean it would put you to sleep reading through that stuff. I did not see one mention of safe deposit boxes. So I don't think you have any protection in a safe deposit box at a bank beyond the physical security there. I think if the bank goes under, I think you're SOL. You're going to have a hard time getting in because the doors are going to be locked. By the way, I heard NYPD was being deployed at Silly Bank locations in the city today. So you know, if they send the bank, the cops to guard the banks, you're probably not going to get in to get your stuff out of your safe deposit box. So I don't think that would be safe. No, Skip. Thank you very much, sir, for the super chat, the support of the channel. And one more, I've got Prem Sports. Thank you, Prem Sports, for the super chat. He says, I can't help but wonder how many fintechs banked with SVB. You know, Prem, I can't help but wonder that same thing. I'm willing to bet it's a lot of them. I mean, $209 million in deposits or, you know, the, the Bloomberg article said $161 billion in deposits. I don't know which one is the more accurate number. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, but that's that's more than a couple of companies here, you know. So somebody is going under from this. I don't know how many of these small startups, but look, they Silicon Valley Bank they marketed themselves as a tech startup bank. So that's most of their customers were tech startups, and most of their deposits were not FDIC insured. So that money is gone. There will be companies going bankrupt because of this. There will be people who don't get their paychecks. There will be people that get laid off. And, you know, look, that San Francisco housing market is already getting crushed right now. I mean, some of the local markets, you've got San Francisco, Austin, Texas, Phoenix, Arizona, and I think Las Vegas was the other one. Those are like the four cities that are seeing significant declines in real estate values right now. Well, San Francisco 
is going to get hit by Silicon Valley Bank collapse. I guarantee you that. Probably going to see the same thing in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, because as companies have been driven out of California by the human excrement on the sidewalks, a lot of them have been fleeing to Phoenix, you know, Scottsdale, Arizona area. So I think they probably took their banking habits with them. So you're probably going to see this hit a lot of people in Phoenix, Arizona, going to lose their jobs because of this bank going under. And that means their houses hit the market. And that means those markets that are already down are going to go down even harder. So this could spill over into residential real estate very easily, folks. Uh, good question there, Prem Sports. And thank you very much, sir, for the, sir or man, for the support of the channel. I appreciate that very much. I think we're, we're all caught up here, guys. And, uh, you know, long story short is this thing just went off. All right. This, whatever this thing was, this, it just went poof. And the dust is not going to settle for a while now. It's, it's going to be a long time before we know who is exposed, who's next. It could be months. And that's, that's what I want you to take away from this stream. We've speculated on a couple of other names. We've talked about deposits that were going to go bad. But we're still learning about who was exposed to FTX. And FTX failed back in November. This is not a story that's going to be over next week. Okay, This story is just getting started. And right now, if you work in the banking system, if you are higher up at one of these banks, it is your job to assure the public that this thing is under control. So there's going to be a lot of meetings this weekend. There's going to be a lot of conference calls, a lot of Zooms, and a lot of stuff. And you're going to have a lot of comments from executives next week, maybe even tonight, reassuring every everybody that all is well. All right. And whether that works or not, I don't know. I don't know if the next bank is going to fall first thing Monday morning or if somebody's going to fall even over the weekend. All right. It's, but this is more of a psychological thing now. They need to restore confidence in people so that they stop yanking their deposits. That is what's going to make or break this, whether or not this turns into a widespread 1929 or more of a smaller FTX. It only stays localized to a couple of outfits. All right. Miss, you got anything you want to add to that? No, I think people just keep your eyes open. I think there's going to be a lot of um, news and it's going to be a lot of the stay calm news we're getting. Um, it doesn't mean it's over. It's, this takes a long time, right? We're still seeing fallout from last June. Yeah. So we could be in this for another year before it really gets going. And, and look, you can't trust the mainstream financial press because you are their product. You're not their customer. Their customers are these institutions that are failing right now. All right. So their first loyalty is to their customers. So keep that in mind. You're not going to get the un unvarnished truth from the mainstream financial press, just like they said nothing about the collapse in bank shares yesterday until it was already over. They said nothing about it. All right. At the same time, don't just take what you hear from some guy on YouTube, self-included, and go run with that and start a panic. All right. Consume both. Read what the read what the bulls are saying. Read what the bears are saying. Somewhere in there, the truth lies, but make up your own mind. But just be careful because you know, the mainstream financial press, by the time they cover it, it's too late. They've already given themselves time to get out. That's the only thing I'm gonna caution you against. And I do, you know, I rail against CNBC and Bloomberg a lot all the time. Because of that, they saw what was happening. They probably saw it before I did. They have armies of analysts watching these things. And they chose all day yesterday to talk about stupid, pointless political theater instead of banking failures. And how many people could have had time? How much money? How many people could have saved how much money if they had gotten that news sooner? And instead, they chose not to cover it. So just keep that in mind. They do not necessarily have your best interests at heart. All right, guys, a couple of thank yous. Thank you, Mish, for all your support today. Thank you to my Blue Wrenches for everything you guys do. Thank you to so many of you guys for the Super Chats today. I really appreciate the generosity, the support of the channel. Thank you very much. Thank you to my Patreon supporters. You guys are awesome. Um, and thank you to Mom and Dad. I love you guys. I think we're going to call it there. Oh, and thank you to you guys in Discord, by the way. I, I don't always mention the Discord, guys, but that is like this intelligence network for the channel. I get so much information through Discord. Thank you to all you guys. There's a link down below to Discord also. And thank you to Mish, who runs a tight ship over in Discord. Keeps the, uh, the, the web going so I catch bits of news as it's coming around, flying around in the network. It makes the channel better. So thank you, guys. You, you are every bit a part of this. So with that, have an awesome weekend, guys. Till next time, live small and dream big.